Good afternoon and welcome to the Lair Student Center at Spokane Community College and the second and final debate in the 2018 race for U.S. Senate. I'm Haley Gunther with KHQ Local News. And I'm Jane McCarthy with CREM2 News. This debate has been organized by the Washington State Debate Coalition, which was founded by Seattle City Club in 2016 to enhance Washingtonians' access to those who hold and seek our state's highest offices. Financial support has been provided by our lead sponsors, AARP of Washington, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Norcliffe Foundation. We also want to thank the Community Colleges of Spokane for hosting this debate in partnership with Gonzaga University, Eastern Washington University, the University of Washington, Washington State University, Spokane, and Whitworth University. This is a town hall style debate and the questions today will come from the hundreds of people here at Spokane Community College. Aside from asking questions, the audience has agreed to remain silent and to hold their applause until the end of the debate, except for now as we meet the candidates. Democratic Senator Maria Cantwell. Hey, everybody. and Republican Susan Hutchison. And welcome to you both. As you watch this debate, we invite you to join the conversation on social media using the hashtag WA Elex, and that is W-A-E-L-E-X. Now to the format of this debate. The town hall, the questions will come from the audience, both here in the room and from our broader audience via social media who have posted questions online. Each debate, uh, each candidate will have one minute for a reply, and then the moderators will lead a follow-up discussion on the topic before moving to the next question. There will also be one minute in closing statements Statements to wrap up this debate. So let's get started. Jim Camden with the Spokesman Review has a question with an audience member. Ladies, I have Frank Malone here who has a question on the topic of the environment. Uh, question goes first to Senator Cantwell and you each have one minute. Thank you. Do you believe in climate change and is it a threat to Washington's coast? Are there steps that should be taken to protect Washington from its effects. Thank you. Uh, thanks for asking that question, and thank you for wearing that great hat and for your service to our country. Uh, my colleague Susan Collins and I did uh, a report, uh, basically asked the government accountability how much climate was impacting us. They said it cost us $650 billion every 10 years because of its effect on our coastline, on our shellfish, the effects we're seeing in catastrophic fires and that we need to do something about it. So I definitely support making sure that we are not only mitigating the impacts of climate change, but preserving great things that help us reduce fossil fuels, like keeping our mileage per gallon fuel efficiency that we implemented a decade ago. That's very important because it helps consumers save on their uh, cost of gas, but also helps us save on our environment. Ms. Hutchinson, you have, you have a minute to respond. Well, first of all, I noticed your cap says Vietnam and Desert Storm. So again, thank you for your service. I, um, I remember that you asked the question, you said, do you believe in climate change? And the word believe is associated with faith. And I just want to make sure that when we're talking about climate change, we base all our decisions on science. You know, uh, when you combine politics and science, you, can, you end up with junk science. And, and certainly, we have to, uh, with a problem as significant as the changing climate, we have to be sure that our decisions as we go forward are grounded in good science and are clear of politics. And this is one of the problems that I have with those that use climate change as a wedge in politics. Of all subjects, if it affects the entire world, shouldn't this be a subject that draws us all together? 
Shouldn't we be working together to uh, bring the best scientists in all the fields that are impacted or have a contribution to make when it comes to determining what impacts climate change are going to have? You know, we've had climate change since the beginning of time. So what are the impacts uh, going to uh, do? We're, 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 okay, we're, we'll discuss it in well, a few we're, minutes. We're, let's continue Great. on the, this topic. And um, how much of climate change that we're seeing right now do each of you think is, re is connected to human activity? Senator? Well, as I mentioned, there is impacts, and that is exactly what the scientists say. So the plan is, let's make reductions in those greenhouse gases that we know are detrimental to our environment. I helped author tax credits to go to more renewable energy, so wind and solar and biofuels, and our state is leading in that. That's very important because if we can change our energy sources to a cleaner sources of energy along with our hydro system, that's going to make uh, for a better environment for the future. Okay, M Ms. Hutchinson, how, how much of climate change, since you, it's been going on since the beginning of time, well, again, right now is, is, is Again, related? I would defer to the scientists to make that decision. Uh, certainly we have an example with the ozone hole uh, that was over uh, Australia and uh, the southern hemisphere for a while, and uh, we tackled that by banning chlorofluorocarbons. And as we quit using those in spray cans, we began to close that hole. And so we have seen how human behavior can change the atmosphere in a way. But we also have to be really careful as we move forward to always balance against the needs of our, our developing economies. We don't want to make those who are um, forced to make decisions that they're not ready to make as they're needing a growth in energy. We need energy to be okay, clean right. as possible okay, and that we, we— Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was—I'd gone over. Did I have a time? Well, the, the, yeah. We're not, we're not timing these, but, okay. but we want to give both candidates right. uh, equal, equal time. Yeah. Was President Trump right to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accords and— our governors, like Governor Jay Inslee on the West Coast, uh, are, were they correct in uh, trying to have their states meet those requirements, Senator? Well, I disagree with pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, one of our leading citizens in our state, Bill Gates, made a major economic investment and tried to get the rest of the world uh, best scientists and investors in innovation that are going to help us deal with this problem for the future. So I definitely believe in a more collaborative approach. And here was Bill Gates waiting for the United States to continue that effort so he could continue on the innovation side. And when the president said we're not going to support that, it is not working together uh, with those nations that could help us address this. It Ms. is Hutchison, a big challenge. Uh, Ms. Hutchison, was the president right? And if he was right, are the governors wrong? I think that what uh, the president was saying is we're not going to have an uneven playing field here. When the major polluters in the world are China and India right now, as, uh, as their growing economies are throwing so much pollution into the air, why should the United States be penalized and they get a pass for several decades? So the president is basically saying this climate accord is not really fair, and it's not going to work. Okay. And so in the pragmatic way of looking at solutions to our environment, I think it's important that we make sure that whatever we pursue is going to work. Senator, is, is the governor right, and, and the other governors on the West Coast, to try and maintain these standards? Well, it's important to create market opportunities. And in Washington, we have several counties who have okay. taken okay. it upon themselves okay. to do uh, the leadership role. So okay. uh, they've decided to make a whole wind okay. overlay. So if a governor wants to help push that along, too, it's a good idea because, as our counties uh, have done, gotten lots of second crops for our farmers. Okay. They get wind and they get wheat or something else, and so it works to I, help us. I, I, Hard to cut off a senator, but uh, 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 back, uh, back to Haley. All right. Thank you, Jim and Frank, for that. For our next question, let's go to Mark Baumgarten, the news and politics editor at KCTS9 Crosscut in Seattle. You have another member of the audience with you, Mark. Thanks, Haley. Um, we have Maya Crawford here. She has a question about trade for you. Will you advocate to lift tariffs um, <clears throat> on our allies and trade partners. Uh, you each have one minute to answer. Uh, let's start with Ms. I'll Hutch. go first. Thank you. Yes. 
You know, I believe <clears throat> that uh, the best free trade is fair trade. And uh, what we are seeing right now in uh, the tariff discussions around the world with President Trump and the administration is an effort to make the playing field even, which has been uneven for a very long time. The average uh, percentage of tariff that we place on other goods is about 3.5 percent. The Europeans put about 5 percent. And do you know the Chinese, 10 percent. But of course, that's grown now that they're in discussions. I am very pleased with what the administration has been able to negotiate when it comes to the agreement with Mexico and the agreement with Canada, the EU with uh, South Korea. And I expect that he is going to do an awful lot on behalf of our farmers and others who export to China when the trade agreement is discussed there. Tariffs are a tool, and I believe the president is using them in order to get the Chinese to the table. Uh, Senator Kentwell, you have one minute. Yes, I will work to make sure that we're lifting tariffs on product made in our state that is now being penalized in other parts of the world. I think tariffs are a last resort, not a first resort. I hope that we continue to modernize agreements like the Mexico agreement. Originally, the president said it wasn't a good agreement, but yet we have grown our exports from $300 million to $2 billion from our state. But now those products are still, even with the modernization of Mexico, still facing tariffs. So why should apples and cherries and potatoes still face additional tariffs in Mexico when it has become a big economic market opportunity for us? So I want them to be used as a last resort, not a first resort. Um, Senator Cantwell, uh, just building on that, um, do you do you have uh, um, do you have plans to support the United States uh, Mexico Canada agreement? Uh, yes, I do want to say that we want to keep modernizing and opening up markets as this does on digital issues, and there are some important dairy uh, concessions that uh, Canada was making a market distortion by supporting dairy prices. So I will do that. But you can bet that I'm going to bring up to all my colleagues in the United States Senate that we have not fully got nominees on the Export-Import Bank, a credit agency that the other side keeps dragging their feet on. Now, export opportunities are key here in the Northwest. I held up the Senate to get the Export-Import Bank reauthorized, but now we can't sell Boeing planes because they don't have a functioning board. So I'm going to make this point while we have this discussion in November. We need both. We need to open markets, and we have to have credit assistance for our companies to gain access to markets. Um, g given that you see uh, the, the new trade agreement um, with Mexico and Canada as having some advantages, I mean, there's a, it's considered a win for labor, um, you know, certainly opening up the dairy market in Canada is, is seen as a victory. Doesn't that validate the president's approach of uh, a more aggressive policy that uses tariffs to, um, to push our trade partners no, to a as, fair deal? No, as, as I said, I believe in tariffs last, not tariffs first. So here we're still dealing with Mexico, and it would have been great to modernize, and as Richard Haas said, the head of the Foreign Council, yes, it's—he uh, doesn't think it's a cataclysmic new deal. So what I'm trying to explain is that when we do agreements like Mexico the first time, it had huge growth for us as market opportunity. So I want to grow on top of them. But now, because of this dispute, we have our products seeing as much as 50 percent tariffs on their product. And what I worry about is farmers losing shelf space. While this debate goes on for another year or so, does some farm not make it through this season? Does somebody lose shelf space, and next year, when they go back to Asia, somebody else, Australia, has got the market space and they don't want to buy from us? All right. I'd like to get uh, Ms. Cantwell's uh, uh, response to, to this in particular. You know, the president urges patience. Um, how, how much, uh, uh, how much um, patience can we expect? I mean, how, how, how long is a reasonable amount of time before um, tariffs turn to agreements with China, say? Um, Hutchison. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. That's I'm okay. So sorry. I just want to make it clear that to our uh, television audience that you were asking the question of me. So um, I have the endorsement of the Washington Farm Bureau. It's a very 
important group of people in this state. And I've had a lot of discussions with people who produce hay or cherries or apples and other farm products around the state. And they have said over and over, it has been such an unfair and unlevel playing field for so long that we are grateful that we finally have a president. These problems preceded President Trump, but we finally have a president who is willing to take it to the Chinese and make sure that we negotiate fair trade agreements. So and farmers in the state are, 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 you know, suffering. There's a, you know, $12 billion bill to help them uh, across the country. Um, how much longer are they expected to, uh, to have that market altered before the Well, as I've talked agreement. to them, and, and I really went to them to ask their opinion about how they felt about the tariffs, and they said they're willing to accept short-term pain for long-term gain. I have seen President Trump move at a speed that most of us have never seen in any administration, and so the renegotiation of NAFTA is an indication of that. Uh, we all tend to be fairly impatient. We want things to go well very quickly. And I think uh, there is a point at which that if we don't have an agreement, because I can talk to President Trump, my opponent cannot, she's a member of the resist and has made it very clear that she can't talk to the president, because I can talk to him, I can be an advocate for Washington state okay. and speak very strongly to the president about moving things along. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Mark and Maya, for your question as well. Our next question is from Chris Schroll, who has a question about health care. Chris, what is your question? Would you support legislation creating a single-payer Medicare for All system in America? If not, what would you do to propose providing access to high-quality health care? Thank you, Chris. Senator Cantwell, thank one you. Minute. Thank you for that question, and it's such an important one. I do believe that access to health care is a basic right, and we should have universal access. I prefer something that I authored in the Affordable Care Act, the basic health plan. The concept is working now in several states, and basically people are able to buy insurance for just $35 a month if they qualify. That includes prescription benefits as well as dental. Why does that work? Well, we had it for a while in our state. The concept is simple. Bundle up individuals and uh, small businesses who don't have the same clout as a large company like Boeing. But if you bundle up 40 or 50 or 250,000 people, now you can force a discount from the drug manufacturers and from the providers. That's what worked in the basic health plan here when it was in our state, and now it's working in New York where over 700,000 people are buying insurance, as I said, for just $35. Thank you. Ms. Hutchinson, one minute. Well, I grew up in socialized medicine, and so no matter what the Democrats want to call it, whether it's single payer or universal health care or uh, Medicare for all, it's socialized medicine, and I've lived it. And let me tell you what it feels like. You stand in line for a very, very long time, and then you don't get a doctor who cares about you. You just get whoever is available. And so, as a military dependent, we were called, that's the health care I experienced, and I would fight any any attempt by the federal government to take over this high-quality health care that we enjoy in America that is the finest in the world. I can't imagine that we would gain by having the government take it over. And so it's very important to me that access and lower cost is the, is the way that we improve our health system. And there are many different ways that health care is delivered. Obamacare came in sort of switch gears. It had no support by Republicans at all, and it had to be passed using a procedural uh, trick in order to get it passed. And because of that, it doesn't have bipartisan agreement. And the next health uh, reform that we do will have bipartisan agreement, because that is the only way we as a country have to move forward. Senator Cantwell, you talk about the basic health plan. So if that is implemented specifically, what are the real hurdles to making that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because Marcus Rochelle here is a local state uh, representative is working hard on getting that passed here in our state. Our state has to decide, like New York and Minnesota, that they want to pursue that option because the legislation gives them that right. But it also helps our state. 
just as the Affordable Care Act did. Here in Spokane, 30,000 people got access to health care. You have 165,000 people uh, on Medicaid. And they now, in this community, uh, are part of an ecosystem. The number one employer here in Spokane is healthcare. So I want people to have affordable access to healthcare. I want great providers to be here in Spokane, and I want the solution to work for us. And I'm so glad that Marcus is leading the way in Olympia to get it done. Ms. Hutchison. Well, I think we need to clarify because the question was, uh, single payer health plans or single payer health care. And I don't think we've gotten an answer yet from my opponent, although I've heard her explain it many times on the campaign trail. She is in favor of socialized medicine. In other words, a government takeover of, of our medical care. And I am not, as I said earlier. So I want to make that important distinction. The other thing is what she's talking about, about health uh, organizations in the Spokane area, those are private. They're privately run for the most part, except for, of course, the Air Force and uh, the medical care that's provided at uh, Fairchild. So universal health care or socialized medicine would make all of your plans illegal. None of us want that. It would mean a takeover of all of our hospitals, our private hospitals and our public hospitals, a takeover of all of that. That is not what we want. And when you hear something like $35 for a month for your health care, that is heavily subsidized, which means your taxes go up I'm even more than they already are. Senator Cantwell, we do have another question from a viewer about opioids. How do you feel about the war on opiates as it relates to the impact on chronic pain patients who are being cut off from opiate medication and new pain patients who are denied treatment with opiates? 30 seconds, please. Well, thank you for the question. We've been from Port Angeles to Spokane talking about this issue and hearing from the local community about how to deal with this issue. So I'm glad we just got a new opioid bill passed. But yes, we are working now with physicians and clinics on what pain management really should look like. We're not turning someone away from the needed medicine that they have to have for whatever challenges, but we're trying to get away from this very addictive drug that is now being diverted into so many places that is causing catastrophic events on us. So, thank you. One of the most important elements of this bill that passed 99 to 1 is uh, that over a billion dollars is being allocated to fight the crossing of fentanyl from, from Mexico. Fentanyl, of course, as you know, is a substitute or um, uh, a heroin substitute that has been cheaply produced in, in Mexico. So part of my question for Senator Cantwell, she's so soft on the border, how is it that we can have such an open border policy from the Democrats, and yet these drugs continue to flow over the border. I'm glad that the bill that passed 99 to 1 allocates money in order to solve that problem, or at least make a dent in it, because there's no question that drugs are flooding across the southern border. We'd like to give you an opportunity to respond. Well, the bill is great in the fact that it's giving law enforcement more tools. And we met with Ozzy here, and we met with Sheriff Pastor in Tacoma, and they basically said, more money for HIDA grants, which help us fight gang activity because they get their hands on the distribution, pass this new law so that we can crack down on the distribution by having the tools to go after people who are distributing it. And I had 39 attorney generals, Republicans and Democrats said, yes, take Maria's language and put it in that bill. So that's what we did. And it also includes new language to crack down on the mail-in, which is coming from foreign countries of this product. So it's great new tools asked for by our law enforcement agents, and I'm glad we got it done. Thank you. And thank you, Chris, for that question. Our next topic here this afternoon is the economy. We have Edwin Aguli here. You have a question about the high cost of living here in Washington. Edwin? Thank you. Housing supply and affordability issues affect every community in Washington, limiting new job development and the money consumers have left over to spend. What is your solution to our state's ongoing housing crisis? That's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. I, uh, I turned to my co uh, colleague, my opponent, uh, 
Senator Cantwell had a heavy hand in developing the Growth Management Act for this state, which occurred about 29, 30 years ago in the legislature. There is no question, but we have outgrown the Growth Management Act. Everywhere I go across this state, people are concerned about the cost of housing. And so when we're talking about housing affordability so that you can find a home that you can afford and that your children could stay in the same region as they grow up and try to uh, access housing is very, very important. So what has happened is the cost of land has gone up so high that we no longer can expand outside our metropolitan areas and build houses that don't cost very much. The other problem is that 40% of every home that's built, every apartment, goes to red tape in this state. It is a crisis and it has to change. And that is something I'm committed to when I'm your senator. Thank you so much for asking that question. I just led the charge in the United States Senate with my colleague Orrin Hatch from Utah to increase a program that is a public-private partnership to build more affordable housing. What people don't know is that we are in a crisis of affordable housing here in Spokane, in Seattle, in many parts of our country, because we haven't kept pace with supply. What increasing the affordable housing tax credit did was allow us to get more projects built. And as soon as we passed that bill, the very first thing the commission here in Washington announced is a new project at Airway Heights. But if I want you to know anything about how great a tool this is for veterans, for aging population, for people who need to be close to workforce, no better example than the Rid Path Hotel in Spokane. It is now being renovated using the affordable housing tax credit for workplace housing in downtown Spokane. This program works. I'm going to go back with Oren when we go back in November and try to get even more done on this because, as you can see, we need more supply. What about skyrocketing rent? There are so many families here in Spokane that are spending half of everything they make every single month just to pay for a roof over their heads. What can you think can be done to help ease the burden on some of these families, Ms. Hutchinson? And again, the rent is the same. They pay that same 40%, the, the people who build those rental units, the same 40%. They cannot build housing that is affordable anymore because of what government has done. Government is not the answer in housing until they can provide incentives that help developers build, especially around transit, build the kind of affordable housing that they can actually afford to build as developers so that people can actually afford to rent them. And again, this is an issue where there's too much government in the way with permitting and fees and red tape, and we need to get rid of it. Well, that is exactly what the affordable housing tax credit does, is incent developers to build more affordable housing where otherwise they wouldn't. And what's great about continuing to make this focus is because if you don't have enough supply in the marketplace, then that that is left over, the demand goes up and basically people are getting higher and higher rents. We have to go back and look at some of these projects that were built years ago. And then as we came out of the downturn, people converted affordable housing into higher market rate programs. That's what's happened in Seattle, that happened in Tacoma, and I'll bet you it's happening here in Spokane. So it is about building more supply. The good news is that that is actually stimulative. To build more construction and to make housing affordable is a good answer, not just for the residents, but for our communities and the economy. Thank you. And thank you, Edwin, for that initial question. Now let's go back to Jim Camden with the Spokesman Review with another member of the audience. I have uh, Jacob Wetham here, and he has a question about politics and political style. Thank you. President Trump ran on getting rid of the swamp in D.C. What would you do to help lift the Senate out of the swamp and heal the damage done to our political system? Well, thank you so much for that question. It's very important that we continue to make reforms in Washington, D.C., I try to work across the aisle and make sure that our colleagues understand that our ideas are coming from people of Washington State. This is so important because whether we're talking about fire and trying to get a fix for fire funding or whether we're doing something like affordable housing, you have to have the ideas and the people in our state. So even though we didn't necessarily agree, my colleagues Senator Rish and Crapo, on a lot of issues, on this issue, we agreed. 
So taking good science and information and making that the basis of our decision making is the most important thing we could do. I don't, I don't think that was the, the intent of the question. I think the question was asking about what's going on in Washington, D.C., which uh, gives so much power to special interests and lobbyists. And my opponent in this race is a poster child for being a D.C. insider and taking advantage of uh, that insidious relationship between politicians and special interests. If you take a look at her FEC filings, you can find, at least this year, over a million dollars from lawyers. Those lawyers represent special interests, and they expect a return on their investment. Another half a million comes from people who call themselves consultants. Well, that's a euphemism for lobbyists. And so at least a half a million dollars worth of personal money from lobbyists has come the way of Senator Cantwell in order to make sure she's on their side. And I am not a professional politician. I know a thing or two about politics, having led the GOP party for the last half decade. But I do know that term limits is one of the ways to stop this problem. Okay. Um, uh, the Senate is a great place to filibuster, but debates not so much. So we're gonna, I'm gonna try and get a couple of quick questions in here with I individual answers. Senator Cantwell, do you agree with the d Democratic, uh, the tactic some Democrats suggest that when they go low, we kick them? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I go. Uh, Ms. Hutchinson, uh, different question. Does it help or hurt the political discourse uh, in national politics when the president uses nicknames for people like Flying Ted, Crooked Hillary, or Horseface? No. Okay. We're, good. We're doing good here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Senator Cantwell, if Democrats regain control of the Senate, would you support reinstating the 60-vote requirement to cut off um, debate on uh, Supreme Court nominations? I think it's very good that we go back and consider that. I do. And the reason is, is I want a Senate that works well together. And I want to make sure that as we continue to move forward, that we are the cooling saucer, as it is often said, to the contrast to the House. So definitely would consider going back to that. Different question for Ms. Hutchison. If a vacancy occurs on the Supreme Court in 2020, should President Trump be allowed to fill it? In 2020, when he's running for re-election? Yes. Well, that's an interesting question because, of course, uh, the, the Senate uh, decided not to move forward, as everybody knows, with the nomination during an election year. But we had two people running for president who are not incumbents. And so the difference here is that there is an incumbent running for re-election. But I do believe it, it depends upon uh, the vacancy that would occur and at what point it is in the cycle. So I think uh, people in all of America can be pleased that President Trump kept his promise and has appointed two people who are constitutionalists that okay. uphold the, the rule of law through the Constitution. So that was a maybe. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. A question more about uh, leadership style than political style. Do you believe President Trump is properly handling questions around the death of Jamal Khashoggi uh, and our relationship with Saudi Arabia? And we go first to Senator Cantwell. I want our president and members of Congress to say clearly, we do not, as a nation, support the killing of media by governments or their agents, that we will get to the bottom of this, that we will use the tools that we have available to make sure that we are speaking for the rule of law and certainly for the freedom of the press. And so I want everyone to be saying that, and I hope that this will be heard around the world. Ms. Well, Hutchison. As a former journalist, I take these sort of incidences very seriously. And uh, this particular one has gotten a lot of attention because he worked for The Washington Post. But I do want to remind us that hundreds of journalists have been murdered in Mexico because they got too close to the drug cartels. Mm -hmm. And there's no one uh, standing up for them. As we uh, take a look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia, uh, there have been 18 arrests now and I think five dismissals from the Crown Prince's inner circle. 
Uh, this is a step forward, as they have admitted that uh, this was wrong. And I do think as we move forward as well, we have to remember that the Saudis play an important counterbalance to the Iranians and the Syrians in the Middle East. We have to look at all the players in the, e in the Middle East with eyes wide open. Okay. Senator Campbell, are, are we doing enough uh, uh, to, to pressure the Saudis, and, and uh, should the question of, of how much they contribute to both the region and, and, and our economy come into this? I've already voted in the United States Senate to say, in the situation in Yemen, that we shouldn't continue to support them in their efforts involved in a civil war if we're having that level of human tragedy and loss of life. So I do want to hold them accountable. We have three tools that we'll be considering. Sanctions on individuals that are involved. This issue of whether we continue to support them in Yemen, which is turning into one of the largest humanitarian crises in the world. And to look at this issue of arms sales. All of those should be on the table, and we will consider all of those when we find out how high up this went in the Saudi Arabian government. Thank you. Senator, thank you. Uh, Jacob, thank you for the question as well. We do have another questioner who is with KCTS 9 Crosscut Politics editor Mark Baumgarten. Mark? Uh, thanks, Haley. Uh, now we have Ali Mershon. Uh, she has a question about immigration. Thank you, Mark. As you know, Spokane and many cities in the state of Washington consider themselves <coughs> sanctuary cities. Do you support sanctuary cities in the state of Washington and why? Ms. Hutchison. No, I don't. We are a country of the rule of law, and I think that any time a municipality takes the law into their own hands and uh, disregards what uh, the law is for the nation, we put ourselves on a slippery slope. I think if the law needs to be changed, people of goodwill need to work together to fix the law. I don't think that sanctuary cities is beneficial to the whole discussion of immigration reform, which certainly does need reform, no question about it, and uh, both illegal and legal immigration uh, need to be looked at and fixed very quickly. And so thank you for the question, and uh, I stand against the designation called sanctuary cities. I definitely support our local governments and our local law enforcement who have said, do not penalize us as you pursue a course on immigration that oftentimes has been struck down by the courts. So why should the sheriff in either Snohomish County or the sheriff in Cowlitz County be penalized in not getting federal dollars just because they don't agree with the administration's approach? So I have seen law enforcement across our state handle this problem very deftly, but they have been clear. They want the resources to continue to do what they do. They're on the front lines of this crisis, and they want to go after the people that are really responsible. And they are doing that, but we shouldn't take away their resources. Um, I have a follow-up for Ms. Hutchison. Um, so uh, another hot-button issue, um, family separation. So in the spring, we saw, you know, um, the, um, the administration uh, doing forced separations. Uh, since your last debate, we've seen The Washington Post report that the administration is considering a new approach which would um, force families who are coming across the border illegally to choose between either being, um, uh, uh, being held together for an indefinite amount of time or having the parents sign over their children to another facility that would then uh, help uh, with the aim of placing them with a guardian or a family member. Um, so, what, uh, so do you, would you support that policy? Well, I think when it comes to whatever the administration decides to enforce along the border, it's very important that we think in terms of what we can do to stem the tide of this porous border of ours and the entry that has been illegal and that has caused so much political discussion for so long. You know, we know uh, that the people of Washington state consider immigration to be the number one issue in our lives. And you know why it is? It's because they see that the illegal or crossing of our southern border is a national security issue. 
and they're afraid. They're afraid of what it's going to do to our country in so many ways. We've already talked about the drugs and the drug cartels, the billion-dollar business that they I'd run. I'd like to stay on this issue of family separation, though. Well, is, uh, let me just go on the record. I've been on the binary, record many the times, choice many policy. times, that I don't agree with family separation except for the safety of children. And if you talk to the border control officers who have been there, they know that part of what the drug cartels are doing is using children to come across in child child trafficking, and they're often accompanied, by, accompanied, most often, by an adult who is not their legal guardian or their parent. And so all of this is very complicated, and I do know that our Border Control works really diligently to do the right thing and the humane thing on behalf of families. Uh, Senator Cantwell, so um, your opponent said that you're soft on the border. Um, uh, I'd like you to respond to that within the context of the fact that we have seen uh, such an increase in the number of families that are uh, crossing the border this well, year. Well, definitely don't believe in family separation and don't believe in touting that you're going to reinstate it again as a way to deal with this problem. I do want border security and have voted for vo border security. I believe, as Tom Ridge said, that if you're going to try to build a wall all the way across thousands of miles of our border, we're not going to be successful. So I kind of take it personally on the northern border when they want to close the crossing at Danville or Medellin Falls and say they don't have enough money to keep that open. That affects our commerce. And we're going to do some idea that we know is not cost effective. So I do believe in technology. I believe in stronger border agents. And I believe in moving moving some of our borders overseas to the most dangerous airports so that we don't have people coming into our country. But on this issue, the main thing here is stability of those countries, those countries where we are seeing uh, exodus of people because they are one of the most dangerous places in the world. We shouldn't be telling them we're going to take money away from them. We should be getting the entire region in Central America to support them and help stabilize with good government, crack down on narcotics, and helping those countries have a more stable environment so we don't have asylum seekers coming to our borders. And do you, uh, do you support um, going back to a catch-and-release policy with, uh, with families? Uh, the asylum would work as people come to our border and ask for asylum. They would go through a review process. That was what the normal process was. You would not be separated. And I think there are more cost-effective ways to doing it. They are not allowed to stay in our country, but you can, while you're going through the process, uh, detain them with more cost-effective ways. Um, Ms. Hutchison, so I'd like to talk about another issue with immigration. Um, uh, the guest worker policy uh, in the country is largely viewed as being um, I apologize. Flawed. I need to interrupt. I'm sorry. We're out of time on oh, that topic. I think I lost. We need to move on to Washington priorities. And our next question came to us online. James Burkett asks, what have you done in the past and what are you going to do in the future to make sure the views and voices of folks in eastern Washington are not just heard, but represented in policy. So we'll start with Senator Cantwell, one minute. Well, that's a great question. One of the biggest priorities we have right now here in this part of the state is to renew the Columbia River Treaty. That's an agreement between the United States and Canada, but it affects our hydro system. If you will, we're paying a little more to Canada than we need to pay right now for that hydro system. Why is that so important? It's important because we can't afford to pay any more for our electric needs than we need to pay. We need to continue to be cost effective. So I was able to work with the last administration, and I do applaud President Trump for making this Columbia River Treaty a priority and getting it down the road in the formal parts of the negotiation. But we can't go another five or six years without this being renegotiated. We need it renegotiated with Canada and modernize our hydro system for the benefit of both countries. Ms. Hutchison, one minute. Well, I think it's an important question because I live in Seattle, and I know that Seattle has a very strong population and a very left-wing government uh, that controls so many ideas and policies that eventually begin to spread throughout the state. And so I think that it's important that Senator Cantwell understand I have been throughout eastern Washington through this campaign and for the five years that uh, 39 counties are represented in the, in the GOP committee. And I know that the folks who live in eastern Washington do not feel represented. And uh, often when I am with them, they say, she's never here 
We never see her in 18 years. We've never seen Senator Cantwell. And the second thing we hear is, what has she ever done for us? And so I want you to know that I will be here for you. I love Eastern Washington. And to your question that we didn't get to answer, the guest worker program is so essential for our farmers and definitely it needs to be upgraded, it needs to be modernized. We need to make it so much more efficient for our farmers to bring in those guest workers for seasonally harvesting our crops. Thank you. Senator Cantwell, do you have a response to Ms. Hutchison saying you're never in eastern Washington? I've gotten to pass four bills this year in the United States Senate incorporated in larger legislation thanks to the people of Washington. I never would have had that opioid bill that we got passed if I hadn't been to dozens of locations around the state and heard firsthand, like in Mason County, how devastating it would be. I can guarantee you I spent summers traveling to Colville, to Chewila, to OMAC, to Chelan, listening to our fire problems, and even had meetings with your congressperson, Kathy McMorris Rogers. I think she's mentioned this in a couple of debates about how we work together on fire. We would not have gotten those solutions if I hadn't heard firsthand and had the ammunition from people here in the state about how to go back there and fight the battle and win the day to get us more money to fight fires. So my best ideas come from people right here in our state. And I'm gonna keep doing that because they're the ones that I represent and they're the ideas that are leading our country forward with innovation and successful results. Speaking of wildfires, Washington State has seen an alarming increase in so-called megafires. So how will you advocate for Washington specifically to combat this issue? I uh, produced a one-minute video in the midst of the smoke that we had in Seattle, which has gone on for the last two years, and the people of Eastern Washington have endured for years. Senator Catwell, if you had been in Eastern Washington this summer like I was, you would have experienced that you could not see anything as you drove the highways of Eastern Washington in every corner of this region. And that is not because of fire fighting money. There's a big difference between fighting fires and preventing fires. And what we're talking about is colossal, catastrophic fires that are totally to blame because Senator Cantwell, at least 14 times and maybe more, has blocked all efforts to have uh, uh, intelligent logging and reforms of our good forestry management. That is the cause of these colossal fires, and it's ruining our summers all throughout the state. And as your senator, I will fight to get logging, intelligent logging, sustainable logging back into our federal forests so they're not tinderboxes ready to burst into flame, and because there are no roads, unable to fight. Senator Cantwell. Well, this is so important that we realize that hotter, drier conditions are causing more fire starts. So I worked with WSU and the University of Washington and said, what should we do about this? And they basically said, do fuel reduction on your pine forests. So I went about getting an agreement from both Democrats and Republicans, the administration and those in the agencies to agree to this concept. And I can tell you it was a lot of hard work. But I used people like Vaughan Brothers Mills here in the Northwest who said, Maria, this is the way to go pursue this. Talk about taking the timber that you're going to harvest and put it into cross-laminated timber. That way people will see it's going to a dual purpose of reducing fuel and helping us for the future. So I'm so proud that here in Spokane, I was out the groundbreaking, we're going to have one of the first cross-laminated timber buildings in the entire state. It is going to be a model of the type of development that we can do. So because I came up with that strategy for pursuing a better management, I got both Democrats and Republicans to the table and we solved the fire borrowing problem so now we can do more fuel reduction for the future. We are nearing the end of our time here this afternoon. Our final topic is one that is so important and it is our veterans. We spoke with a number of veterans in preparation for this debate and one Spokane area veteran told us, quote, a shortage of personnel at VA hospitals and service centers is causing delays in critical medical and social services for our veterans. What would you do to remedy this? We'll start with you, Ms. Hutchison. One minute, please. Thank you. I am the daughter, wife, and mother of military officers. 
my son, my second son, has just become a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. As I mentioned earlier, I grew up in socialized medicine in the military under my dad, and then when I married my husband, who was also a Marine. I care so deeply about the plight of our veterans, and in the town hall halls that I've been holding around the state, because my opponent would not debate, and I decided we've got to talk to the people, so I would go to many of the cities in this state and hold town halls. That is a question that comes up every single time. What are we doing for our veterans in the VA hospitals? Well, I've spent a lot of time in a VA hospital, and because of my dad, and I know that, um, that they are inadequate for the need. I would recommend that our VA hospitals become centers of excellence for the needs of our wounded and our, our veterans who have unique military-associated diseases, ailments, injuries, and this includes PTSD. And then I believe that the most efficient way to deliver care to our veterans is allow their benefits to stay with them for their personal doctors close at home. We have veterans around the state that are traveling two hours we'll have to just to off. see a doctor that's approved by the VA. We'll have to cut you off there, Senator. Well, my father served in the military in World War II. He served in the Navy, and his brother was a glider pilot in POW in World War II. So when he got out, I guarantee you, health care was the premier thing that they were concerned about. What we need to do here in Spokane is continue to support the VA facility and continue to modernize it. We need to upgrade the mental health facilities for PTSD and to make sure that we have more primary care infrastructure. That is in this year's MILCON budget, the budget that's supporting the construction of military in our state. And we, along with Senator Murray and many other of our congressional delegation, are continuing to say we want more investments in Spokane for military. The bill that we just passed in modernizing our VA also said that families can be reimbursed as caregivers in these situations, and it helped modernize medical electronic records so that our veterans get the better care by having managed across various services that they go to get, that it's all coordinated and better care. It's so important that we not privatize the VA. I've listened to what veterans say, and they tell me they don't want to privatize, but they do want, if they have emergency care, to be able to go to other facilities to get that necessary and emergent care. Another big issue throughout uh, Eastern Washington involves medical marijuana and our veterans. A growing number of military veterans do use medical marijuana to treat PTSD, chronic pain, a variety of, of ailments. Some say it could be a possible alternative to opioids, And uh, but right now government physicians are barred from uh, prescribing that to our veterans. Um, even when it's legal here in, in Washington state. Would you support changing this policy? And if so, how far should we as a nation go toward legalizing veterans' access to marijuana? Ms. Hutchinson. Well, I think medical research and scientific research is showing that there are substances in marijuana, just like there are substances in a lot of the plants that surround us, that definitely can help ease pain or cure even some diseases. And so I would be in favor of moving swiftly forward with the uh, National Institutes of Health in order to implement the changes in the law that allow us to use those substances to, to provide medications that are uniquely suited for the needs of our veterans and pain management. Senator. I definitely support making sure that marijuana as a medical tool is further advanced, including access to veterans. You know, when you look at what Canada is doing to basically take that base root product and turn it into pill application, they are making more scientific R&D investment on the future opportunities and the research that will let patients know what it really can do for them. I want us to be right in line with that. I want us to have the research, the scientific information, and the access. Do you have a rebuttal to that? I don't think, uh, I don't think we disagree. <laughs> to all right, I, we're going to move on to closing statements now. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. We are moving on to the closing statements. We flipped a coin, and Senator Cantwell, you begin one minute. Please. Thank you so much for hosting this, for the moderators, for the audience, and of course, for my opponent, Susan Hutchison, for being here as well. This is an important time in our country because we have a lot of partisan divide. 
but I want you to know I will continue to work with anyone to get things done for the state of Washington. That's why I'm working on the first incentive for apprentice at the federal level so we can skill more people for the jobs that they need. It's why I worked across the aisle on the fire fix. It's why I worked hard to make sure that our sales tax deduction was made permanent and why I support making sure the Exim Bank works for all of us as we continue to make and grow things here in Eastern Washington. I want to focus on our economy of the future so that everybody has access to affordable health care and affordable housing and has good paying jobs. And that is going to be part of the legacy that we're growing right here in eastern Washington, a great economy. So I ask people for your help and support today in sending me back to fight for you to be your voice in the United States Senate. And I only have one thing left to say. Go Cougars. I hope we really show what the Palouse is all about today. Thank you. Ms. Hutchison, one minute. Well, there's an old saying that says, no one cares how much you know until that you, they know how much you care. And so we have heard from my opponent. She knows a lot about the other Washington. She's been there for 18 years. But she doesn't care so much about this Washington anymore. And I think nothing frames it better than her statement in the voter pamphlet about her community service. Every one of you has access to that, and I, you may have read it, I certainly have, and she says that her community service is hiking and climbing mountains. Well, you can compare that to mine or just about anybody in this room. Community service is helping others. But when you look at hers, it's about herself. And that underscores, of course, that Maria Cantwell is not caring for us. That's one of the reasons that I'm in this race, because I want you to know that when you elect me your senator, I will care for you. I will be here often. I will listen. I will hear. I will be your voice. I will speak for you. And when I'm elected your senator, it will be a bright new day in Washington state. Thank you. That's it for this second and final debate for the U.S. Senate. Thanks to our lead sponsors, AARP of Washington, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Norcliffe Foundation, along with supporting sponsors, the Boeing Company, Smith Barbieri, Progressive Fund, and Washington Realtors. Tonight's debate was organized by the Washington State Debate Coalition and its founder, Seattle City Club. The coalition comprised of civic leaders, nonpartisan organizations, colleges and universities, and media partners committed to send, setting a high standard for political debates. An important reminder, ballots have been mailed to voters within the past few days. They must be postmarked or put in a drop box by 8 p.m. on Election Day. That, of course, is Tuesday, November 6th. Please make sure to get out and vote. And thank you to our town hall audience and all the great questions. And thank you to Senator Maria Cantwell and Susan Hutchison. They took part in two coalition debates to discuss the issues in the race for U.S. Senate, so we thank you for that. And as we say goodbye from Spokane Community College, remember to vote, and let's give the candidates a round of applause. Woo!